Good day, everyone. My name is Mike Lasecki. I'm your host for today's webinar. And welcome to Basic Principles of Survey Question Development. Thanks for joining us today. We'd like to thank ATE Central, the information hub for the National Science Foundation's ATE program. They've made this web webinar possible through their webinar hosting services, and you can find out more about them through their website, atecentral.net. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the Evaluation Support Center for the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate serves the ATE community and others by holding webinars on evaluation like this one, maintaining an open access resource library, curating a blog about STEM education evaluation, and collecting and disseminating data about the ATE program. Be sure to visit the Evaluate website. You can see it there at the bottom of the screen, evaluate.org. The NSF does have this signature program called Advanced Technological Education. And that program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges with lots of partnerships to universities and K-12 institutions as well. It funds projects in high-tech areas like advanced manufacturing, engineering technologies, IT and cyber technologies, and nano and micro technologies. So thank you, NSF. The materials for this webinar are available to you. The slides and handout, in fact, are posted on the Evaluate website right now, and the recording will be made available to you within two days. Typically, it takes us about that much time to generate the recording. So you automatically get a link to that recording. You can also access these materials at any time during this webinar, right where that arrow is pointing to the web links page. If you click on Materials and then Browse, remember, you're going to go to a new browser window, so don't forget to come back to this webinar window when you're done looking at today's materials. Thank you. Let me repeat my introductions. I'm Mike Lasecki. I'm with Luca Partners, and I'm the host for today's webinar. Our two presenters include Lisa wilson Vecho and Lori Wingate from the Evaluate Center. We're really looking forward to hearing their expert presentation today and behind the scenes. In the development of this webinar, we'd like to acknowledge Emma Perk and Kelly Robertson from Evaluate. Thanks, Emma and Kelly. Our colleague Sharon Gustin, Gusky excuse me, from Northwest Connecticut Community College helped in the preparation of this webinar. And Cynthia Williams is Evaluate's editor from Style Sheets. She made sure that all of the words were perfect in today's presentation. Joining me at Luca Partners are Janet Penhorn, you've received a lot of communications from her, and Shannon Payne, acting as IT support. Thank you, Janet and Shannon. It's a good time to remind us that the information presented today, although supported by the National Science Foundation, the views expressed are those of the presenters, and not necessarily those of the NSF. So that concludes all of our announcements. Don't forget this webinar is going to be recorded. I know many of you wonder about that. Now let me turn over to Lori. Go ahead, Lori. Well, thank you, Mike, and hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. We are here to talk about developing good survey questions, but first let's situate that task in a larger view of what a survey entails. Before you even begin thinking about what to ask in your survey, you first really need to clarify the survey's purpose. And it's quite helpful to actually write a survey purpose statement as a reference point to ensure you're staying on task as you develop your survey questions. Once you're clear about the purpose, you can start creating your survey. And it's a good idea to do some background research on your topic, as well as to look around to see if you can find examples of how others have asked about your topic in surveys. And then you may be eager to launch your survey once you've got your questions together, but it's really critical to pause here to test your survey and make sure it's going to work with your intended audience. Once your survey is finalized, there are a lot of steps you actually need to go through to get your survey to the right people and to actually get them to do it. That can be a real challenge. 
Now once the data are back, you need to make sure they're clean and usable, and only then do you get to analysis and writing up and disseminating your results. And if all that went smoothly, you will be able to serve that original purpose. So if survey questions are really just one small piece of this work, why are we devoting an entire webinar to the topic? Well, I'd like to answer that question by asking you a question. Have you ever taken what you thought was a bad survey? So if this sounds like something you've experienced, you can go uh, above the slide area, and there is a little person with their hand raised. So if you click on that, you can raise your hand. So do that if you've taken a bad survey, or maybe you had to answer uh, what was a bad question in an otherwise decent survey. Or maybe you've had the, yeah, if you've had that experience, if you've had that misfortune of having to answer what you thought was a bad survey question, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, I see people starting to raise. A lot of folks are raised. So this is not, not an unusual thing, right? Um, and so if you raise your hand, we're going to go ahead and use the chat box for the first time and go ahead and get used to this because we're going to be using it a lot. If you raise your hand, um, Put a little note in the chat box to say how that experience made you feel. What kind of thoughts went through your mind as you were answering what you thought was a bad survey question? OK, Carrie was annoyed. Yvette is frustrated. Pamela is saying it's a waste of time. Oh, a lot of wasted time. What, you guys, you guys don't have anything better to do than sit around and answer survey questions? I'm really surprised by that. So right, yeah, um, I'm not going to be able to read all your comments that are flying by, but it's probably resonating and being very uh, similar to what I feel, which is thinking, well, that survey developer just isn't very smart, or they sure don't understand me and my context, or this is definitely wasting my time. A lot of you pointed that out. It also makes you wonder, what are they going to do with this information? It's just going to be nonsense. So bad survey questions can make survey respondents, as you've clearly demonstrated in your comments, feel frustrated, angry, bored, or even worse, they might feel offended. So any of these feelings can prompt a person to quit your survey. And if your questions are poorly crafted, you know, even if your respondents do complete your survey, your data are unlikely to have much validity at that point. So you really have to get the survey questions right in order to have a solid foundation for all the other steps. And likewise, you should be thinking ahead to those other components as you develop your questions, especially with regard to analysis. It's really hard to make sense of data that came from poorly crafted questions. So while in a classroom setting, and certainly in this webinar, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Ask any question that comes to your mind. But in survey work, Maybe we don't have stupid questions per se, but it's really easy to end up with ill-formed questions that aren't going to provide you with meaningful data that you need for your evaluation or research project. So as Ursula K. Le Guin noted, there are no right answers to wrong questions. And in survey work, there's no good information that comes from bad questions. We're going to present the rest of this webinar in two main sections. So we have 12 principles of good survey questions that we're going to review with you. And these are based on best practices that you're going to find in any good book on surveys, any good website. Um, and they're also informed by Lissa's and my own experience with common errors we've seen and, frankly, committed in some cases um, in surveys. So I'm going to present the first six principles, and then we'll have a question break. And after that, Lissa will lead you through principles 7 through 12. And we'll close out the webinar with a uh, final question break. And please do stick around for our brief feedback survey. As Mike has uh, hinted, we do need your active participation throughout this webinar to illustrate the principles of good survey questions. We're going to be presenting you with various example survey questions and asking you to comment on any problems you see in the question from the perspective of a respondent. And then we'll share the principle we're addressing and show you one way that the example question that has problems could be improved. Now, to avoid any confusion about this activity, before we ask you to do it, I'm just going to walk through it and demonstrate for you. So you can just sit back and relax for the time being. So first question, we're imagining a survey that's being developed to assess employee engagement in an organization. And the surveys want to ask, surveyors want to ask questions to better understand the employment status of the respondent. So here's a question that could be drafted for the survey. What's your FTE, which is just a fill in the blank. Now, you might be thinking, well, what's an FTE? Or I know what FTE means, but I don't think the average employee in my organization does. 
if you, F, if you know the F, what FTE means, you may wonder, do they want the percentage of a 40-hour week work or something else? Should I indicate number of hours I work? So to comment um, on what you see as a problem with this question, you would go to the chat area, which is on the right side. You guys have already found the chat area. But I'll just put a mock one here on the slide. And you'll type something like, what does FTE mean? So just a brief note that points to the problem in the question. And after you've had a chance to share your reactions to the question, I'll highlight the principle that the question is violating. So in this case, it's principle one. Language is simple and direct. Questions are free from jargon, acronyms, and ambiguous terms. In our example question, it was that acronym that was the problem. So acronyms should be avoided in survey questions unless you're 100% sure that every single respondent will know what they mean. And you should avoid jargon and technical terms as well as any term or phrase that could be interpreted in multiple ways by different respondents. So after I review the principle, we'll debrief on your comments as much as possible. And I'll highlight the problem, which is that term FTE, as I've already pointed out. So basically, what does it stand for? Um, even if the respondent knows it stands for full-time equivalent, that's not everyday language. And if it's a percentage uh, that's being looked for, is that of a 40-hour work week? So when I worked at Loyola University many, many years ago, we actually had a 37.5-hour work week. So if everyone isn't reporting based on that 40-hour work week in this example, the data are going to be messed up. So even if we remove the acronym in the case, we'd still, we'd still have problems. So we'll dissect the problem, and then I'll suggest one way that the question could be improved. For example, if the data point that we really wanted was how many hours a week people work, instead of FTE, we could ask how many hours per week do you work in your job, and offer a text box like this so they can write in the number of hours. So in this, in this reframing of the question, we're asking for the information we need in a more direct and concrete manner. And importantly, we've gotten rid of the acronym and that human resources jargon. OK, that was just the demonstration. Now it's your turn. So here's the second question. And so Mike, if you want to go ahead and take away that uh, middle box, that'll give more space for the chat. Uh, second question, how confident are you in your grant development and management skills? So this question could be asked of employees at a nonprofit organization or college. And the response options here are not at all confident, somewhat confident, or very confident. So if you see any problems with this question, you can just go ahead and note them in the chat box. And I'll do my best to keep an eye on them, but it's quite a lot of you to comment. Um, I will give you a hint for this question. We want you to focus on the question, not so much the response options. OK, so a lot of people, or a few people at least, are pointing out there's actually two things. Yeah, Kathy, Bernadette, both pointing out we're asking two questions, a lot of you. Stephanie, Joe, OK, you've got it. Um, this question is actually asking two different things, so grant development skills and grant management skills. These are actually quite different things, which brings us to principle two. Each question in a survey asks about only one thing at a time. So just because two things seem to go together in your mind as a surveyor, this doesn't mean that your respondents think of them as a unifying thing. But you see this all the time. A couple of examples I've seen in actual surveys are um, combining career and education in the same question, skills and knowledge, interest and ability. So putting two concepts in a single question is a really, really common mistake. And it's also a really big problem because it's not clear what you're measuring. So many of you saw right away that this question is actually asking two different things, confidence in one's grant management skills and grant development skills. So this is called what this is called a compound or a double-barreled question. And it's an easy mistake to make when two things or ideas are linked together frequently. So this kind of question, you know, as I said, you're not going to know if people are answering from one concept or another, and you're not going to know what the data mean when you're, on the, when you're doing analysis. And it can be really frustrating to respondents who may have different opinions about these topics. So to fix this question, we would first need to decide if we really need to know about both things. And if the answer is yes, then we would want to separate out this compound question into two separate questions, each which is asking just about a single thing. So if you find yourself wrestling with this issue in your own surveys, first ask yourself, is there really a unified concept that I want to know about? And what's the right word for that? Or are there really, do you really need to know about two different things? And then proceed accordingly.
Yeah, Adriana is. Yeah, see, sometimes when you're in these uh, in these kinds of settings, the the error is obvious. But sometimes when you get right into development, it's really easy to to forget these rules and make these mistakes. And Adriana pointed out that she had just seen one um, recently. Okay, well, thanks for doing that. We have some more from you, of course. Question three: Here, you're being asked to indicate the extent to which you agree or disagree with a statement. It will not be difficult to apply what I learned in this webinar. So you have four options from strongly agree, I'm sorry, strongly disagree to strongly agree. And in this case, you're being forced to express an opinion. You're not being offered a neutral option. And I know that may be an issue for some people, but I'll just let you know for this example, that's not the issue we're looking for. We're just looking for, uh, we'd like you to focus on the question, the statement there. So if you see any problems with this question, again, you know what to do, put a note in the chat box. Okay, I see a lot of negative um, people pointing out negative. Sophia, Janice, Jack, everybody's honing in on that. Uh, a lot of people are honing in on the double negative. Um, and that is exactly it. So, you know, maybe you had to stretch your imagination a little bit and, and think how you would feel at the end of this webinar, but clearly you were able to handle that. And so it is, the problem is with the du double negative. So we have uh, that not difficult and we have disagree. And so it's very confusing, as you noted. And that is principle three. So no more than one negative term is used in a question, including its response options. And I've highlighted the negative terms here, not, difficult, disagree. So if a respondent wanted to disagree with this statement, they would be saying, I disagree. It will not be difficult to apply what I learned in this webinar. So I don't know about you, but my brain has to work to translate into that into something I can understand. So two negatives make a positive. So if I disagree, it won't be difficult. That means I agree, it will be difficult. OK, so that's really confusing. Um, but it's really easy to make this mistake when you use negative terms in your response items, like in an agreement scale. So anytime you use a scale that includes negatives, you should avoid negatively phrased statements. So this item should be stated. A better way to state it would be, I will be able to apply what I learned in this webinar. Now, I do want to point out that I didn't say it will be easy to apply what I learned in this webinar, because adverbs and adjectives in the question stem can interfere and confound uh, with, the, with the agreement scale, with the, the adverb strongly in the agreement scale. So if you strongly disagree that something will be easy, think about that. Does that mean you think it will be difficult? Um, what does that mean? So instead of just asking, of asking saying it will be easy, I'm saying I will be able. So we get rid of, the, of those modifying words. Next question. So as Mike mentioned at the beginning of the session, this webinar is funded by the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program. So this question is asking, what is your role in that program? Are you a principal investigator, an external evaluator, or a project staff member? So if you see any question, problems with this question, you know what to do. OK, Chris is pointing out there's not enough categories. Might not include every role. That's right, Bernadette. Yvette's pointing out there's there's not an other option. Yeah, a lot of Bailey's pointing that out as well. Yeah, so other and limited options and, not, and the absence of an other category. Those are the two big issues. So that brings us to principle four, which is that response options are exhaustive and reasonable answers to a question, all reasonable answers to a question are included with another option as needed. So when you ask somebody to complete a survey, and you think you've probably all been on that side of it, you're, you're asking for their time, which may be the most precious commodity we have these days, right? So if your respondent doesn't see themselves represented in your survey, it can be a real turnoff to doing it. And maybe it may be offended or simply think they received the survey in error. But this problem is easily addressed by including an other option when you can't include the entire universe of all possible response options. And this applies to any kind of question, not just when you're asking for somebody's role. Could just be their opinion isn't represented. So the problem with this question isn't what's there, it's what's not there. So anyone who isn't part of the ATE program would be annoyed by this question for sure. It's not appropriate for them. And it doesn't offer, so it doesn't, it should have a not applicable option. And if you are part of the program, the options are pretty limited. So to fix this question, we'd want to make sure all the typical roles are included. So in the correction here, we've added internal 
evaluator and grant specialist, as well as an other uh, response with a fill-in and a not applicable. Now, there are other roles we could add, but we also have to keep in mind that adding more answers just puts additional burden on the respondents, because they have to read through all the answers to find the best response for them. So to further minimize the burden on respondents who aren't part of this program, or whatever it is in your situation, for if it, the question isn't applicable, we could ask a question before them that filters out respondents. So this, in, in this case, we would ask if the respondent is involved in the ATE program. And then if they're not, they wouldn't even see this question. Saves them time. So we're almost into the, to the we're almost to the, to the end of the first half of the webinar. So I'm going to take us through principles five and six, and then we'll have a question break. So if you do have questions, um, Mike will be uh, paying attention to the chat box, and he can present those questions when we do have our break. So question five is a typical demographic question asking for age. So your options are to indicate that you are 20 years or younger, or in an age group that spans 10 years, starting at age 20 at the low end and at the high end, you can be 60 or older. So if you see any issues with this problem, again, you know what to do. Kathy's pointing out they're overlapping. Yeah, everyone's pointing out that they're overlapping. Yeah, and I bet, you know, raise your hand if you've ever seen this in a survey that you have either done or taken. I know I've made this mistake because it's just real easy to do, especially on those low and high ends. Um, so. As Liz is going to talk about later, we should only ask respondents for information that's really pertinent. So we could say, the, qu the issue could be, do we really need to know age? But I didn't give you a context for this question, so let's assume that age is relevant. So the issue really is that overlap. So as many of you noted, it's not clear how you're supposed to answer if you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, because you would fit in multiple categories. I happen to be 50, so yeah, I'll put myself in that 40 to 58 range, because I like that better. That sounds good. So having overlapping answers is a violation of our fifth principle, which is that response options are mutually exclusive and possible answers do not overlap. Now in this example, if your age ends in zero, um, you could be in two categories. And this happens a lot with number ranges, but it can happen in other types of answers too. Like if I forced you to say whether you are an evaluator, a researcher, faculty member, or a project leader. So those categories aren't mutually exclusive. You have to be real careful with those kinds of questions, and particularly with number ranges. So you know how to fix this question. We're just going to adjust those breaks where we think they're appropriate and double check to make sure there are no overlaps. All right, we just have one more demonstrate or one more question before we go to our break. So question six. This time, we're actually going to have you react to three questions at once. So here are three statements about research and compliance that could appear on a survey of faculty at a, at a university. So the respondent is being asked to indicate the extent to which they agree or disagree with three different statements. And again, um, you know what to do. If you see any problems, put them in the chat box. Now, don't worry if you don't really know what research compliance entails. That's not really the point here. I could have said dog grooming or nanotechnology here, so that's not the issue that we're looking for. I'm just scanning your, your um, answers. I, I give you a little more time here because I know there's a lot to take in. OK, Brittany's pointing out there might be an issue with that scale. Yep. OK, Adriana's pointing out, what does that middle category really have meaning? Ruth is pointing out this is harder. And it's true, it is a little bit harder. I'm going to give you a little uh, minute. I'm going to take a drink of water, and then I'll come back. OK, Kathy has pointing out the rating scale is not appropriate for all three questions. And she is spot on with that observation. And I went by, but somebody else pointed out that last question should really be a yes, no question. OK, so when we have a matrix like this one, so we have the same response scale for several items, you know, that's a really efficient way to present questions in a survey. But you have to take extra caution to be sure that all your response options really make sense with all of the question. That means every single one. So. It's an efficient thing, but you really have to take pause and take time to make sure they really make sense. 
So that's principle six, response options match, question stem, and all possible answers make sense with the prompt. Now, opinion questions work pretty well with agreement skills. So there really isn't a glaring problem with this first statement. But for the second statement, the problem is with the adverb vary in the statement, because the respondent is supposed to agree or disagree that the, the statement Sorry, the word vary is in the statement that the respondent has to agree or disagree with. So it confounds the agreement scale. So what does it mean if someone strongly disagrees that they are very knowledgeable? Does that mean they're moderately knowledgeable? Or does it mean they know nothing about the topic? It's really hard to interpret. But I really do see this a lot in surveys. In the third statement, the respondent is basically being asked if they have received training about compliance. So agreement skills just don't make sense when you're asking somebody if they did something or not. So I could ask you, did you eat breakfast this morning? So you could say you ate a lot or a little, or that you usually or rarely eat breakfast. But there's real, not any differentiation between agreeing or strongly agreeing that you ate breakfast. It's meaningless. You either did it or you didn't. So if you want to ask the respondent if they have done something, you know, make it a yes, no question, as somebody had um, pointed out in the chat. They did it or they didn't. Or it could be a frequency question, like how often do you do x, y, or z. And as a side note with agreement scales, you also want to make sure, as, as several of you pointed out, that that middle category is really a reasonable response. And Liz is going to say more about that later. So to fix this question, I would delete very, that adverb very, from the second statement to avoid confounding the scale, and I would convert that third statement to a yes, no question, something like this. And notice in the revised question, I also operationalized training to mean completed a training session. And I put a time boundary on the item of in the past 12 months for greater specificity, because I thought training was receiving training was pretty vague. OK, so thank you so much for playing along. We're going to pause now for a question break, and then Lissa will walk us through principles 7 through 12. So if you have questions about anything we've covered so far, now is the time to ask, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Laurie, it's Mike. Thank you. You've really made us think much more deeply about surveys, I think, than any of us typically do. I have several questions for you. When you're writing these survey questions, what level do you write to? You know, sometimes newspapers write for the eighth grade. I forget exactly what that goes. But, but is there a rule of thumb as to what level you write to? Mike, that is an excellent question. Um, I would say, so uh, when I write surveys, it's typically for an audience such as the one par uh, participating in this webinar. So it would usually be for people, um, but still, I would want to keep it at a 12th grade reading level for clarity. You want to be clear. You want to be concrete. You want to be specific. And we also want to keep in mind that um, even though our audience might be highly educated, they're not all, they don't all have English as a first language. So we want to use common terms. We want to speak very clearly. Um, you know, anytime you're writing for an audience, that's a really important consideration. And then when you're writing survey question, it almost doubles because you want to make sure they're understanding the question in exactly the same way that you intended. Now, if you're dealing with different audiences, um, you know, children, uh, maybe people with less education, you really need to, to know what you're doing there. And um, that's not an audience I work with, but I definitely want to ask ex experts. And, and we'll talk, be talking later about testing survey questions. So even if you think you are writing at the right level, it is definitely worth taking a, a time to actually try out your questions with your audience. Well, that makes sense. Good response. Several people have commented, and I'll sort of paraphrase their questions, when is a survey too long, or is there a rule of thumb about the maximum amount of questions or the maximum amount of, of time that when you construct a survey? Well, the guidance? guideline is always to make it as short as possible. I mean, there's no absolute, like people will do surveys if they're less than 10 minutes, and they won't do them if they're over 30 minutes. It doesn't work like that. It's really hard to get people to even answer like a one or two question survey, as I'm sure many of you know. So you absolutely don't want to waste their time with extraneous information, um, extra questions, things that you think might be interesting but aren't pertinent to your topic. Um, you know, I think 15 minutes or less is is kind of typical, maybe. Um, but if you're doing something you know complex that requires more 
um, effort and you have to make it longer, that's, that's the way it is. But again, uh, knowing your audience is important and always make it as short as possible to get the information that you need. Now, thinking about that, do you use those survey progress bars? Because sometimes people, if they realize they've been 60% of the way through, that mm -hmm. helps them finish it. Do you ever use those? I do really bars? like progress bars so that when you're doing a web survey, the person can see how far along they are. You know, are they going to be, be sitting there for another 20 minutes or are they almost done? It's really good. You can also tell people, it's just good standard practice to tell them about how long it will take them to complete it. Um, you can let people know how many questions there are. I will say that gets more complicated when you do have a survey that has a lot of branching questions. And we talked about you know, filter questions and branching so that different respondents get a different number of questions dep depending on how they answer. And in those cases, sometimes those, you know, the time estimates and the progress bars aren't as meaningful. But again, you just have to, you have to play it by ear a little bit um, sure. depending on your context. But I think the more information you can give to people about what they're getting into, um, the better. You know, there's a lot of questions. We won't have time to get to the, all of them now, but maybe we can respond either in the chat or later on. But let me let me close this question and answer session with an interesting question. You know, there is this thing called survey fatigue, right? People just can't stand doing surveys anymore. But is it acceptable to try to incentivize them, perhaps by economics or some other method, to complete your survey? How do you feel I think, about that? Um, I, surveys are, I mean, sorry, incentives are a good idea, and Lissa can probably pop on, and she just, I think she just helped co-author an article about the uh, the effect of incentives on surveys. Um, sometimes you're restricted on that in terms of what you can do with a grant. Um, also, you have to have a budget. There's issues with doing drawings sometimes because that's a little bit like gambling. So you really have to know your context, but incentives typically do help response rates. And of course, there's different ways of doing incentives. You can give somebody it before they even complete the survey, or you can give it to them after. But if you, you know, it's, it definitely helps if you're able to do it. Okay. You know what, as we transition to Lissa's section, why don't we conclude the questions, but Lissa, will you come on and just briefly, please make a brief, what you might think about incentives and then take us forward into the webinar. Of course. I think there's a lot of different things that you can think about when it comes to incentives. I know some people mentioned that they're economic incentives. Lori talked about having a big lottery or maybe even just providing a $5 gift certificate. Um, but also there's other things to think about in terms of social incentives as well. Um, later on, we talk about a resource, a textbook by um, Dillman and his colleagues. And we'll show you that a little bit later. But that's a really great resource that talks about a lot of different incentives. And I see that. Um, someone is asking whether or not incentives introduce bias. Um, and I, again, I think that goes back to who your audience is and what your incentive is. Um, there are great ways to do it and, and wrong thing, ways to do it. So it's all depending on the context. You know, Alyssa, there's a, a, we have lots of interesting audience questions and interaction today. But let's get to your next six principles. I'm going to advance us to your opening slide. Here we go. And take us forward. Great, right. and we still have one more question break, so I'm sure we'll get to some of those questions later. All right, so let's continue reviewing the basic principles of good survey questions. So like in the previous portion of the webinar, we're going to ask you to point out some problems you see in the questions we show you using the chat window. So get your typing fingers ready. So we have principles 7 through 12 to go. So in this question, the respondent is being asked about their opinion of the overall quality of this webinar. So if you see any problems with this question or the response option, share what you see in the chat window. The question reads, what is your overall, what is your opinion of the overall quality of this webinar? Met my expectations, good, very good, exceeded expectations. So I see someone pointing out, Carrie points out that the responses are out of order. Lisa says that they're just not good response options. Stacy points out that the scale is actually mixed between expectations and good. Someone else is saying that they're not consistent. Um, yeah, the response options and the scale seem pretty inconsistent. The response options might not be mutually exclusive either. Yeah. Is there anything else? Oh, there we go, Marsha. Marsha says that there are only positive options here. Right, exactly. 
Um, great. So this question is a good example of violating Principle 7. So Principle 7 says terms used in a response scale are consistent and balanced. They represent either a continuum of the same concept, which is called a unipolar scale, or of opposite concepts, which is called a bipolar scale. So if we take a look back at that question, as you, some of you pointed out, the response options are not balanced. There's actually no way to voice any type of dissatisfaction with the webinar in question. The lowest possible rating you could give, a respondent could give, is met expectations. Doesn't really seem quite balanced, right? And then secondly, as we talked about, the question stem and the response options don't really match. The response options within themselves don't match. There's expectations mixed with good quality, right? So, I mean, what do participants really expect from a webinar? What are these expectations? And does expectations really belong in the same kind of continuum with good and very good? So all of these concerns could really influence the quality of the responses that you get from a question like this. So if you're really interested in capturing data on the quality of a webinar, perhaps a scale of very poor to very good might be more appropriate. And you can see that we also added in some more negative response options here. So if we line up these new response options, it's easy to see that they are pretty balanced. We have two on the positive end, two on the negative end, and one in the middle. If we put the original response options we had on the scale, you can see that it's pretty, like it's very heavier on the positive side. So making sure your response options are consistent and balanced will really help respondents to answer honestly and accurately. So let's critique the next question. This question might be asked of students. It asks, how do you generally get to campus? The response options here are by bus, car, bike, walk, maybe you live on campus, other, and don't know. So what kind of issues do you see with these, this question, or maybe the response options? Write them in the chat. So Jennifer points out, they don't know, question mark? Right, Joe says, how can they not know? You know, a lot of you are pointing out, don't know is not relevant, it's insulting. That's a really great point, Judith, right? Like, sometimes when we make these errors in survey responses, survey questions, the, the respondents really feel offended by what we're saying. Great, yeah. Usually is also a vague term, too, right? What do we mean by that? Yeah, definitely. You guys are all pointing out some really great errors in this question. So questions like this lead us to principle eight, which states don't know and not applicable are included only when they are reasonable responses. So like we said before, how like the this don't know option is just not really appropriate, right? How would someone not know how they got to campus? Like of course they would know this. And there are uh, some questions where a don't know option just really isn't appropriate. And this tends to happen when we're writing a lot of questions at once, and you've been including don't know or even a not applicable option, and you just get in the habit of including this option. But you don't really stop to consider whether it's appropriate to every single question. So fixing a question like this is pretty easy. Just don't include the don't know option. So this time, let's look at three separate questions to illustrate the next principle. So I'm going to let you critique all three, and then we'll discuss them together. So this first question would be given to faculty or staff on a college campus. The question asks the faculty to rate how welcome underrepresented students feel on their campus. So what do you think about this question? Are there any issues with how the question is being asked? Write your responses in the chat. So I see some people asking, what is an underrepresented student? The fact that the STEM and the choices don't match. Welcome slash satisfied, right? We have a mix of that going on. I see Jennifer says, how would you know? It, it would be your perception as faculty, not their perception of students. I love that Peggy points out, are you asking for faculty to mind read of students? Exactly, yeah. All great things to point out. All right, let's look at the next question. So the second question is an open-ended question, and it also might be asked of faculty, and it asks, what do you think are the most important considerations when it comes to instructional design for adult learners? So what do you think about this question? Do you think respondents would have any problems in answering this question? So write your comments in the chat window. So Marsha points out that it's kind of complex wording. Tammy says it's very long, complex, limit the questions. Allison asks what type of considerations? And Berman points out that it, this question is pretty general, right? 
Yvette says, needs boundary conditions, yeah. And, and you know, we have this big open box, right? Like how are we expecting people to answer? Are we thinking that they're going to write a mini essay to this? I mean, how much time would that really take a respondent to answer? Yeah, these are all really great points. We're going to look at one more question before we review the principle. And so the third question asks, could be asked of anyone. And it asks, how many ounces of water do you drink per day? With just a, a blank at the end for people to enter in um, their response. So what do you think about this question? Do you think there are any potential issues? Are there any concerns with the validity of the data that you might collect? Brittany says it's really hard to estimate that you might get a response bias. Uh, some people point out that ounces is a problem because we're using the abbreviation, but also the fact that the unit might be different depending on where people are coming from. Um, Anna, I, I, 5.75 ounces, very specific. <laughs> And then uh, some people are just saying that, you know, different ranges of values might be useful. Right, because how many people really measure exactly how much water they drink every day? So all of these questions that we just looked at actually violate principle number nine, which is simply that questions can be readily answered by respondents. So this seems like a pretty obvious and straightforward principle, but again, sometimes it can be easy to forget. And so these three questions each violate this principle, but in different ways. So the first question that we looked at, we are asking faculty to respond regarding how students feel. So any question that asks someone to respond for a group of people that they don't actually belong to is trouble. It's asking the respondent to make an inappropriate reference. How would faculty know if students felt welcome, like we were talking about before? Would you really trust their responses as appropriate? So if the creators of this survey really wanted to know how underrepresented students felt, they should just ask the students directly, right? And then in the second question, we are requiring a significant cognitive burden on the respondent. It's really requiring to them to think a lot about what instructional design is, what instructional design for adult learners is, and then on top of that, what they think the most important considerations might be. It's a lot to ask of people. And if we, we talked about before that there's just a lot of surveys out there, there's a lot of survey fatigue, so it's just kind of unreasonable to expect that people will spend a significant amount of time or thought responding to a question like this. So if the response to this question is really important to your evaluation, it might actually be better asked in an interview format rather than a survey format. Looking at this third question, um, the respondent is actually asked to provide a very specific measure that they might not track on an everyday basis. So while some respondents might be able to estimate their water intake, they might not be able to give an exact number of ounces. So uh, we want to avoid asking questions that require exact recall over long periods of time or for daily activity that might not be remembered afterwards. So let's move on to the next principle. So this question might be asked on a training feedback survey. It asks, how long have you been an evaluator? For less than one year, one to five years, six to 10 years, 11 to 15 years, or 15 or more years. So do you see any issues with this question? You can share them in the chat box now. So what if you had to answer this question? Would you have any difficulty answering this question? Do you think everybody might be able to answer this question? So we're seeing, yeah, some people ask, have you already aimed at an evaluator? So if this is a general feedback survey, it might not necessarily be aimed only at evaluators. Brittany points out, what if they're not evaluators? Anna says the same thing. Yeah, so we're kind of we're kind of noticing that maybe people aren't, everyone answering this survey isn't actually an evaluator. And Amanda even says evaluator might need definition. Definitely. These are really great things to think about. So it brings us to principle 10. Principle 10 reminds us that all questions should be appropriate for all respondents, and that branching can be used when one or more questions are pertinent to only certain types of respondents. So like some of you pointed out in this question, not all respondents to the feedback survey might be evaluators. What if you're not an evaluator? How would you respond to this question? You know, we frequently survey multiple audience members, and it can be easy to forget that not all questions are applicable to everyone. So this question would be pretty easy to fix just by simply asking a branching question that said, are you an evaluator, yes or no? And then that way, only evaluators would see this question. 
But then, like we said before, maybe we need a job title for an evaluator or a definition so that everyone responding to this would be on the same page and so that we're not getting a lot of noise in our data. So we're going to give you a break on critiquing survey questions for the last two principles. So to illustrate principle 11, I want to walk through a quick scenario that you might be familiar with. So one morning, you check your email inbox and receive a survey invitation. You click the email invite. I'm sorry, the invitation email <laughs> invites you to participate in an online survey about a training you recently attended. So you enjoy the training, so you agree to take the survey. So the first page of the survey thanks you again for your participation and essentially reiterates the same information that was in the email text. You click to the next page. The second page of the survey provides further information about the survey and why you're being asked to participate. You click to the next page. You see yet another page of text. Now you've clicked through four pages of text, including the email, and you haven't even gotten to the first question. You're starting to get a bit irritated because, of course, you only have a few minutes before your next meeting. So this page here explains the question topics and response options. Here you can see that the response options are labeled with a number, with a word, as well as letter acronyms. Getting a bit repetitive, right? You click to the next page. Some of you said you're already out of here. You're not even going to respond to it. But here, on the next page, you finally see the first question. And the first question reminds you, yet again, that they are referring to the survey development training that you recently took. It also labels the response options with numbers and letter acronyms. Phew, I don't know about you, but I am already exhausted, and we haven't even answered a single question yet. Right? I mean, I have a feeling that you have seen surveys like this that are pretty verbose and wordy and repetitive. So this brings us to principle 11. Principle 11 reminds us that the entire questionnaire should be as concise as possible. Any extraneous or duplicate information is omitted from the questions, the instructions, or even the communication. Some of you are pointing out that you already would have deleted the email. You wouldn't even gotten through all of those pages of text, right? So sometimes when we're creating surveys, we want to make sure that the survey conveys as much information as we can to the respondents we don't realize that we're actually making it more difficult for respondents to answer the survey. And it can be easy to go overboard. For example, if we look back at the survey from our scenario, why are there both letters and number labeling of the response options? As a person who's going to analyze the survey data, you might recognize that those numbers like, are how the response options will eventually be coded for analysis. But these numbers really mean nothing to the respondents. Therefore, they should just be left off. Sorry about that. Instead, you should just directly label the response options. So this cuts out even more text from the previous page of the survey. Other things that could be done to improve the concision of the survey is to make sure the information from the email invitation is not just repeated on the first page of the survey. You don't really need to preface the topic or the future questions or over-explain the response options. Um, you can be as concise as possible. The original version also included the word question before the question numbers, right? Respondents know it's a question. There's no need to add that extra text there. All right, so let's talk about demographic questions for a bit. I know this is always an area where people have a lot of questions. And we often see demographic questions included in surveys. So these might be questions about race, ethnicity, gender, age, or even income. However, these questions are typically considered sensitive questions that respondents don't really like to answer. So there are ways that you can ask these questions respectfully, but the first thing you should always consider is whether or not you really need to ask these questions in the first place. Demographic questions should only be asked if you intend to analyze the survey results by demographic characteristics. Like, will you compare the answers of female to male respondents? Is that comparison important to your evaluation? Maybe it's not, and if that's the case, you don't even have to ask these questions. So principle 12 reminds us that all questions should support the survey's purpose. Demographic questions are only one example, although an example we see frequently. We also see surveys that include questions that the survey writer might find interesting, but are not necessarily pertinent or relevant to the overarching evaluation questions. Asking these side questions are really confusing to respondents, and it makes respondents wonder what their data is even being used for. It also adds unnecessary length to your survey. So like before, when you were talking about survey fatigue, you know, responses are hard enough to get. Just don't do anything that will scare off potential respondents. 
So those are the 12 basic principles to constructing good survey questions. All of these principles are listed in the handout for this webinar, and these can be used while you're writing survey questions or maybe even reviewing survey questions that have already been drafted. So using a list like this can be a really good self-check to look at questions, but it's not always enough. So before we head to our final question break, let's talk for a second about how to take survey pretesting a step further. We hope you recognize by now that writing survey questions is not simple or straightforward. Good survey questions lay the foundation for quality data, so it's so important to take the time to develop the best questions you can. There are a number of different ways that you can think about pretesting survey questions. So like we just talked about, you could use a checklist or an assessment tool like the basic principles handout to perform a self-check. You could also have the questions reviewed by an expert. The reviewer might be an expert in survey development, or it could be an expert in the content area that you are currently evaluating. You could also go a step further and think about conducting think-alouds with your target audience. Think-alouds are a great way to validate survey questions. Essentially, in a think-aloud, you meet one-on-one -on -one with a potential respondent, and you ask them to read the survey questions aloud and talk through their thought process in responding to the question. This can give you really great insight on how respondents are interpreting your question and whether or not they're responding in ways that you intended. Survey questions can also be tested in a focus group. So this is a really great way to get a multiple perspective on questions all at once. It can also be really great in brainstorming possible solutions to issues that may come up. And finally, you can pilot test your survey questions. So pilot testing generally involves sending your survey to a subsample of the target audience. This subsample would respond to the survey in full. And you would then analyze the pilot data in order to make sure the data gathered will answer your evaluation questions adequately. So we found that think aloud to be one of the most useful steps in pretesting survey questions. So in order to give you an idea of what a think aloud would look like, we want to play out a quick scenario for you. So I'm going to be the evaluator, and I have asked Lori to participate in a think aloud about this question. Hi, Lori. Hi, Lisa. Uh, so I'd like to get your thoughts on a question that I'm developing for a feedback form. So could you please read this question out loud and tell me how you would go about responding to it? Sure. OK, so what did you expect to learn from this webinar? And you, I can say I wanted to learn about survey questions, how to administer a survey, and how to format a survey. Um, Actually, Alyssa, I am actually teaching a workshop on uh, developing survey questions next month, so I was just interested in how you were going to teach it. So I don't know, like none of these really apply to me, and it, it wasn't what I was coming mm. to this webinar for. Interesting. Great. Well, thank you, Lori. Well, from that, you can immediately see that I realized my question might not be appropriate for respondents like Lori. So this type of feedback might not get caught in a desk review by a colleague. So if you only have time to do one type of pretesting, we would really recommend Think Alouds. And if you're interested in learning more about Think Alouds, we actually have recently posted a blog on the Evaluate blog about Think Alouds. So we wanted to share a few additional resources if you're interested in learning more about survey development and management. So this is actually the textbook that I was mentioning before about pre and post incentive. Um, Dillman and his colleagues, this is one of the most utilized textbooks on survey design. It also has a lot of really great suggestions when it comes to survey management and dissemination. So this is definitely worth checking out. Um, this other textbook is actually on the newer side. It's by Sheila Robinson and Kim Leonard. And so if you're interested in reading more about designing survey questions, this book is easy to read, and it's a great resource to have on hand while writing questions. So we are going to shift over to Mike for our final question break. Thank you very much, Lisa. Lots of huge amounts of information there. Here's a question for you. On one of your slides, you showed a four-item Likert scale with no neutral. And Lori, when she showed her Likert scales, it had a a neutral, is there a rule of thumb there that one has to incorporate that? Or you're, 
It's up to you. That's How does a great that work? question. I think a neutral option within Likert scales is actually a hotly debated topic within the survey world. Um, I think there are some situations in which it's obvious that a Likert scale, uh, a neutral option on a Likert scale is not appropriate, right? So a lot of times if we're asking about feelings or opinions, it's really hard not to have an opinion on something. So in that situation, that wouldn't really be appropriate. But sometimes you can think of contexts where, you know, people really would have uh, no opinion or a neutral opinion on something. So in that case, you should include them. Okay, good answer. Um, I'm going to ask you one more, and then we'll turn towards Lori. In several cases today, we've had age ranges or numeric values. Is there any rule of thumb, or do you just do what makes the most sense? Like, for example, 5.7 ounces of water, or between 5 and 8 ounces of water. I mean, how do you make that judgment? So in the beginning of the webinar, Lori talked about how you should think about the entire survey process when you're constructing your questions. So I think the answer really goes back to what data are you really trying to collect, for what reason, and how are you going to analyze it? So if it's a situation where you need a very specific answer, like maybe ounces of water, and you know your respondents can provide that specific of an answer, then yeah, maybe you should have a number box, because that's actually easier to provide. But if it's something that you don't think people will have an exact response, or you don't need that exact of a response to answer your evaluation questions, then you can do a, a, a range option. OK, good, makes sense. Even though I promised that would be the last one, let me try one more on you, if it's OK, if your voice isn't giving out. Um, what about online survey tools? People are aware of SurveyMonkey. Are there other ones that might be free that we could try or use that you're aware of? Yeah, I think the, the tools available for online surveys have definitely exploded in the past five years or so. You mentioned SurveyMonkey. I also know um, at universities we tend to use Qualtrics, but that is certainly not a free platform. I would also check out Google Forms actually has some really great options in creating sure. online surveys. I think the other ones are Question Pro. Um, there, there are certainly a lot of options that you can you can Google out there, but really make sure that it meets the needs of what you're trying to look for, and look at the back end of how it uh, lets you access the data afterwards. I think that's something that people don't necessarily think of when they choose a software to use. You know, Alyssa, so much so many of us respond to these surveys on our phones now. Is it automatic that they'll be formatted for mobile, or do you have to go through any uh, hoops to get that to make to make that happen? Yeah, that's a great point, right? We're always trying to respond to surveys on our phone. And that depends on what software you're using. I know we use Qualtrics a lot here at Western Michigan. And Qualtrics will show you a preview of the survey, what it looks like on a web platform and also on a phone. But I think you have to pay attention to the types of questions that you're going to use on a phone to make sure that it's not going to get too wide. People like to use matrix questions a lot, and those don't really work well on mobile platforms. All right. Yeah. OK, good, thanks. Let me, let me turn away from you for a moment to Lori. Lori, a lot of us survey events, and this question has come up several times. What's your, how do you approach an event? Do you survey before? Do you survey after? What's, or do you survey in the middle of it? What's the best way of approaching timing of event surveys? That's the question. Unmute your phone. Uh, uh, yes, I did. Um, so that's a good question, and I'm hoping others in, in on in the chat can chime in. But I, I would refer back to the purpose of of the survey of the survey, and I don't. Let's say it's a science festival, and so there's like if you do it at the very beginning, people won't have a good sense of what it's about yet, and maybe people are just uh, starting to arrive. If you do it at the end, people may be tired, ready to go home. Um, a lot of people have left already. So, um, you know, but maybe there's a reason not to do it in the middle. I don't know. But you really have to, like, what's the event? What what information do you want to capture? Um, and then 
you know, how much time is it going to take to, to collect the data? Sometimes these things are done in person. I saw earlier somebody asked about capturing demographics because it's important to know the demographics and you aren't nece going to necessarily analyze by demographic. And that's certainly possible. So again, going back to the purpose of the survey, if one of the reasons is to understand your audience and you need that demographic, then absolutely it's going to be, you know, important and appropriate to ask about um, the, the relevant demographic category. So, you know, that seems sort of a cop out, but always go back to the to the purpose of the survey and make sure you're staying true to that. Okay, makes sense. Um, I have another question for you, and this is like the sixty-four thousand dollar question. How do we increase survey response rates? Is there a is there a golden rule, or how do you how do you do it? Well, there's certainly a longer answer than we have time for. Um, Lissa mentioned Don Dillman's book, The Tailored Survey Method. Absolutely read that and do everything you can. I'll say the biggest hurdle you're going to face is if it's email, getting people to open the email. So spend time figuring out the best uh, subject line and try to send it from somebody that the, the person knows and, and respects and wants to help out. <laughs> One of our... Uh... Alyssa uh, also commented in the chat that it, she's right. There's no golden rule. It it pays to know your audience. I've found um, that who the email comes from can make a lot of difference, right? If if there's some knowledge of you or your organization, it could help as if it comes from something anonymous. So that's just a small uh, comment on my side. I know Lori and Lisa, we're just about at the about the end of our time here. We'll probably can stay on for uh, just another minute. What I'm going to do. And we'll put up the survey, our own survey for you. And everyone, I know you'll be, and we'll have 100% survey response rate to our own survey today. But we can actually continue our final conversation while that survey is up. So let me do that right now, folks. I'm going to advance the slides to asking you to please complete our feedback survey. And here it goes. Now let me just warn you that um, not all the survey doesn't act the same in every every uh, format, so this should open to another browser window for you, and please take a moment to complete that survey. So Laurie, Laurie and Lisa, while we're, while we're wrapping up, um, I think I've learned one thing from surveys today. It's probably going to take me more time than I thought to really create a survey that obeys these 12 principles. Is there a rule of thumb? I've got a five-question survey. How much time should I allow to really thinking about making it happen. Lori, let's let's hear from you first. Well, I don't I don't I cannot give you an exact time. I, it always takes longer than you think. When you dig into these questions, you can always find issues that need resolving and then you need to take them uh, you know to your experts, to your to your target audience and, and make sure they're really going to work. Um, it's not something you're going to sit down in an hour and do and have great questions. You, you know, it does, it takes a lot of time. It takes more time than you probably think. Sorry, that's not a, a great uh, concrete answer, but that's that's really the way it is. Is there any magical numbers that you might say? And before I ask you to respond, friends, if the, uh, depending on your machine, you may have to click on the survey link and browse to yourself to make it happen. So just go ahead and do the best you can there. We'll also send out a reminder of that survey link. Back to you, Lisa. As you're preparing surveys, do you think, oh my god, I better put a couple of hours on this, or how do you do it? I think uh, with almost everything in evaluation, we're always looking for the easy number and the exact response. But it does depend on your context. It depends on if you've created a survey for that audience before, if you have something to start with. But I agree with Lori that it always takes longer than you think it's going to take. Um, even here at Evaluate, you know, it takes longer than we ever think it's going to take. So make sure you get people to read over your survey questions because it's always hard to pick up on your own writing. And definitely do think alouds with, with potential audience members. I like the think aloud idea. That's a very valuable takeaway for me today. Well, colleagues, I'm going to leave the survey link probably open for another two minutes, and then we'll shut down the webinar. This officially ends our webinar today. A ton of questions, great audience participation. And Laurie and Lisa, thank you very much for all the time you went in preparing. This webinar just went perfectly, so I want to thank you again. All right, colleagues, we're going to close the audio portion of our webinar. I'm going to stop the recording, but I will leave the system open for two minutes. A ton of thank yous coming in from our audience, Laurie and Lisa. So that officially concludes our webinar today. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>